All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. All right, he's back. <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. I got Travis Nix, associate contributor, Young Voices, JD candidate, Georgetown Law with a concentration in tax law. I'm sure this is a hot item. Uh, we're gonna talk about the upcoming Supreme Court Justice vacancy. Travis, thank you for being back on the show, how are you? Good, thank you so much for having me again. All right, I don't want to presume what you know or believe about what should happen next. So if you would give us your sentiment and I respond. Yeah, first off, I just want to say that um, Justice Breyer had a incredible tenure on the court. He's a stalwart legal academic. It's always sad when we lose somebody on the court, especially someone of his caliber of intellect. Um, as far as what's going to go next, I think it's going to go pretty smoothly for the Dems. They only need 50 votes. I think they're going to get 50 votes. I would like to see a more balanced justice. Um, a liberal judge be elevated to the Supreme Court, court someone like um, Judge Costa on the Fifth Circuit. He mm -hmm. would be a great nominee, very balanced judge on a very conservative court. Um, so I think that would be a good elevation. He was nominated by President Obama and was confirmed 97 to zero. So I think if he were to be nominated, that nomination would go very smooth. You know, that's fascinating. I'm glad that you said what you just said. You know there are people on the conservative side, they would like to see a conservative justice, which doesn't make sense. It makes no sense whatsoever because you seek to have a Supreme Court that's actually balanced. Well, what does that mean? That means that they battle back and forth on the scholarship of law. Some ideological principles do seep in, we have seen that routinely, but no one can deny Right now, it's not a fair game, brother. It is completely a conservative court. So let me ask you this. Would you criticize any Republican senator who would stand in the way of a liberal judge who does have the credentials and the scholarship to serve on the US Supreme Court? Um. Well, it depends who gets nominated. The problem is right now, Biden has this pledge where he said and reaffirmed today that he's going to nominate a black female. Hold, 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 hold the hell up, hold the hell up, young man. How is that a problem? Well, no, it's not a problem, but I'm- That's I'm what you said, you said it's a problem. There is, the no, problem there is no, yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is there's no current appeals court judge who's under 70 years old who is who meets that criteria. So we're elevating the district court judges and being a district court's judge where you're running trials, criminal and civil trials is a very much different than serving on the Supreme Court and being an appeals judge. So if he's gonna go by his criteria, I think the only one who's really qualified is Judge Kruger, um, Justice Kruger on the California Supreme Court. She's immensely qualified and talented. She has um, written repeatedly and talked repeatedly about how law needs to be stable and predictable, two values that I hold, two values that I think a lot of um, conservatives who would be confirming her hold. So I think that um, she would be the most well qualified judge who meets Biden's criteria to then become a Supreme Court justice. So let me take you to a fundamental document of the United States of America, it's called the Constitution. What does the Constitution say the qualification is? Uh, there's no qualifications, but the Senate needs to confirm. They need there to you get go. Their the Constitution allows for a person that doesn't have a law degree to be a justice technically. The Constitution allows for an individual who has never served as a judge to be a justice. And George W. Bush actually toyed with the idea of nominating someone who had never been a judge before, but had what he called significant legal and judicial uh, uh, pedigree. But it was shot down. Now, my point to you is this. When we're, talk, when we're talking about balancing the court, Travis, we would like to see a balance of experiences. That's what we would like to see. Now, we do have to determine that individuals have the capacity, they have the work ethic in order to do the job. It's a tough job to do, but let's be clear, they have help, all right? They have legal scholars, they have researchers, they have clerks, they have help. Uh, in their judicial rendering, their research, their philosophy. And 
for us to say in order to be a Supreme Court justice, it must meet this particular qualification. And that's the narrow sense of um, or the narrow way to get there. I think it lacks the common sense notion that the framers of the Constitution did have in mind, which was, hey, we want to make sure that the court has diversity in this sense, that it doesn't take a person that has all of these qualifications to get here. Now, obviously, I have my beef with some of the other things that the framers put in that document. But do you think only an Ivy League educated person who has served at the appellate level can be in that position? Or are you open to the idea that there are a whole lot of black women qualified who the federal government never gave a chance in the first place? Well, <clears throat> well what I would say to that is um, when we look at what the framers did and who they, who George Washington nominated for the Supreme Court, we had uh, Justice Jay, the first Chief Justice, one of the key framers of the Constitution who led the American legal movement and who was the first Secretary of State as well. Um, very important job that he did. So when we're looking at qualifications, we need the people who are most qualified, who have that intellect. What you said there is that you said judges can rely on their clerks, essentially. I don't want judges to rely on recent law school grads to interpret the Constitution. They need to have a coherent judicial philosophy. And that's not what district court judges do. They run trials, they admit evidence. But Travis, don't know Travis, that, that's not, don't, don't misquote me, brother. That's not my point to you. My point to you is very simple. When we talk about balancing the court, it's not just political ideology or ideological stances. We're also talking about balancing the court because we need a plethora of experiences that are germane to Americans, plural, to represent that court. We do not have black women on that court. We need a black woman on that court, a black woman that's qualified, and we have plenty of them in the United States of America. I think the game that has been played, and you're playing that game right now, is that, well, we can only have a particular person that has a particular track or journey in the judicial system in order to be nominated to the Supreme Court. Well, by the traditional standards of discrimination in America, you have already dismissed many qualified individuals who did not have those opportunities historically. We're trying to change that as a culture and as a society. We're moving in the right direction through advocacy and action. But we can still have a black woman that's well qualified to serve on that bench without compromising anything. And no, they don't, everybody doesn't lean on some college students or recent graduate. Every single justice has a team. That team engages with that justice on various levels depending on how that justice runs court. You know that. So this isn't, no judge would allow anyone else to run it without having a real check and balance process for that court. So no, it's not depending on those individuals, it's using them as every justice does today. Yep, yeah, but to actually have that stop, you're the stop when you're a judge. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a concrete judicial philosophy that you can rely on to interpret the Constitution. We're talking about interpreting the Constitution. This is the most important thing that legal scholars and academics do. And the only qualified person on Joe Biden's shortlist right now is Judge Kruger on the California okay. Supreme Court. He is All immensely right. qualified in my opinion. Well, I think it's more than one black woman in the United States of America immensely qualified to be a Supreme Court justice. Because this country has appointed, presidents have appointed many individuals to that Supreme Court who did not have significant background interpreting the US Constitution, look at the first. Supreme Court nominees to that court. Now granted, the laws were different and still evolving, but they didn't have some plethora of background in interpreting the Constitution. Would you not agree? Well, yeah, because they helped make the Constitution. So they know exactly what the framers intended to do. So that's You know, why that's really not- interesting you say that. I'm glad you brought that up. So the early justices, you say, well, they helped create the Constitution, but they disagreed on it. All of them disagreed on the Constitution. Even the ones that were part of the matrix of development disagreed on what the framers actually intended by the constitutional standard. There was dissension amongst them. Well, yeah, but then they compromised and agreed on a specific tax. That's the way the Supreme Court has always worked. The majority rules, brother. 
No, I was talking about the constitutional debate, not the Supreme Court. You said the framers disagreed when making the court, but they compromised on a text. That text has meaning to everybody. So, so let, let's that. go back because I think I think we're talking I think we're talking over each other. Yeah, my yeah. point to you, and I'm going to make it again. My point to you is that when you say these qualifications must come first before there's a qualified judicial nominee to the Supreme Court. Well, those qualifications were not a prerequisite to the early court. And even with those individuals who are closely connected to the development of the country and the understanding of the nuances of the Constitution disagreed on the merits and interpretation of the Constitution. My point is simple, you did not have some kind of extreme background and credentialing required for early Supreme Court justices. That's something we end up making up later. The Constitution never provided for that. And the Constitution never created a prerequisite other than a Senate approval. I don't think we should get far away from that. And when you start saying, well, these are the only people who can sit for the bench and there's only one black woman qualified to do so in America, you have already played into the game of bias and the game of exclusion when we're trying to create a court that is more inclusive, not only of education, but also experience. Yeah, but the thing is, the Supreme Court is completely different than what it was designed to be. It was designed to be the least powerful branch of government. And what's it turned into, it's a very powerful branch of government. They are deciding cases that the framers never intended the Supreme Court judges to decide. So many issues that should be handled by state legislators have worked their way up to the courts. So when you have a more powerful Supreme Court, you need to be more careful about the judges that you are putting on to make sure that they are well qualified, have set judicial philosophies and aren't just partisan hacks. You know, it's interesting. So let me present this to you. You don't think there's room for a Supreme Court justice to continue to grow and change if need be his or her judicial philosophy? No, I would like them to have consistent judicial philosophies for their basically judicial careers because that gives predictability. The Senate knows who they're voting for okay. and it makes the Supreme Court less powerful as an institution. All right, so I'm for a rule that would make them come under a reconfirmation process. That's been talked about, I'm for that rule. Let me tell you why I'm for that rule. I'm for that rule because I would like Supreme Court justices to have the flexibility in order to grow in their judicial philosophy. Every judge will tell you this, you're currently in law school, I'm in law school. Some of my professors are sitting judges. Every single judge that I have, and some of them have significant federal experience. Every single one of them said, I think about things differently from the first day that I was on the bench to to now. But there's a barrier that says they can't really steer too far from their noted judicial philosophy. And I wanna create an atmosphere in law and in society and in politics where they're able to say, I've learned some things, I see things differently. I've changed my mind on something. Why is that a bad thing, brother, in the Supreme Court? Well, I think it's bad because um, it gets just too unpredictable. We don't know what they're gonna do. For example, it's always- but That's not, that's not the, the matter of the court. Job. Travis, the, tra- the, the, the court isn't supposed to be there just so you can predict it. It's a, they're supposed to get it right. You don't want them to be authentic in their judicial philosophy. You'd rather them just stick to a judicial code because they believed it 10 years ago and now they see things differently today. They learned something new. Come on, man, what profession does that, Travis? Name a profession, any profession in America where you're not able to change your mind or grow as you continue to work and operate in that profession. What profession allows for that? Well, the only way to interpret the Constitution correctly is originalism and textualism. And no, I don't think that's, any of that's untrue. Is the Constitution a living document or is it? It's not a living document. It's not a living document? No, there's a way to change the Constitution and that's- That means it's a living document. That means that the Constitution is able to be transformed, to be changed in different eras. That's exactly what we've done. Amendments of fancy words that means correction. So the purism of the Constitution was actually antithetical to the notion of democracy in the United States of America. Even the Constitution, my dear brother, has room to grow, but you don't want justices to have room to grow. No, I would like to justices to have follow the original meaning of the Constitution so that we get predictable laws and it limits the power and the scope of the federal government. What about the Declaration of Independence, same thing? Uh, The Declaration of Independence should not be used as a tool of constitutional interpretation. It is not- I like that you said that. 
I agree with you on that. What I disagree with you on is this notion that somehow the original meaning and intent of the Constitution should always remain intact. That means I'm three fifths of a person. That means the Constitution when written, well, you can shake your head all day, it's in the Constitution. An amendment had to correct that, a correction had to come to correct that. The original intent was different. You can talk about original design as it relates to the power of the court, but all of a sudden you want it to be the original design as it relates to the constitutional application or the judicial, the individuals in judicial power. You want it both ways. No, I don't want it both ways. There's ways to change the Constitution as okay. the states have done through the amendment process. It's not the judge's job to change the Constitution. Yeah, um, we just need more diversity on the bench, brother. We'll leave it at that. We'll agree to disagree. Okay, all right. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.